Hello and welcome. My name's Karen O'Connor and this is Things That Make You Go Mmm. This is your podcast to help you make the most of the wisdom and experience that comes with getting that little bit older. Let's get right into it. Hello and welcome. I'm here again with Elizabeth Gould. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. Good to be here. We start we ended last time we were talking about archetypes and how we can bring them in our lives and everything and we we realized that we could just go off down some rabbit hole and and keep talking about things and life in general and we've just spent I kid you not nearly half an hour (laughs) talking about societal maturity and personal maturity and responsibility and everything so we're off down some rabbit holes this morning (laughs) here we go So let's start talking. One of the things that you said after we finished talking last time, we were talking about listening. And listening is actually a skill that isn't necessarily taught, is it? It's not. And it's such an important skill to know how to listen, not only to each other, but to what's going on in the world around us. I think it's a hidden superpower if you know how to cultivate it. You can get a lot of information by listening too. Yeah, just I remember talking to somebody a few years ago and he commented that he's one of those people that will walk into the room and within 20 seconds he can figure out who is Kingpin and he goes across and talks to them. He's And he said, I'm not one of those people who stands at the back of the room and observes. And I said, I am one of those people who stands at the back of the room and observes because I'm watching everything that's going on in that room. I'm figuring out where everybody fits in. I'm not just ignoring the whole thing and walking to the middle. So there's two completely different sides, aren't there? Absolutely. And I think it's all sort of reading, reading energies, which we're not taught in school, but is inherent in us. We can feel things and sense things, but we all have a different approach. One, one guy's, I want to go towards action and somebody else may be like, oh, I want to hold the whole picture or be somewhere in between in the middle of the crowd. So there's so many ways to do this thing. So tell me what listening is for you. What is listening? It's first of all, shutting my mouth for a moment (laughs) and getting into my body. So fully inhabiting my body so I'm aware of the sensations going on and being present, being as completely present as I can, which these days in age is a tall order because there's so many distractions in the world. There's always something, whether it's on our screen or in our environment, just being still and fully inhabiting our bodies and being in the present moment. Easier said than done. That's what listening is to me. So in terms of listening, what does, so as somebody on the receiving end of listening, because I know, and where I'm going with this is I know when I meet somebody and we're talking and I'm trying to tell them something and then they cut me off halfway through the sentence. That never feels good. I think every human being has a basic need and desire to be heard, to be understood, to be loved. And when we give our attention 100% to someone and are able to listen and receive what they're trying to say, that's like the greatest thing. That's so deeply satisfying. Do you notice that when someone listens to you truly and doesn't cut you off, how that makes you feel compared to someone who's oh yeah I know that and then they go running on to their own story it's really a big thing and at the core of our human feeling life I would say I hadn't thought of it from that perspective for me when I want to listen to somebody and I've done a fair bit of training in personal development in being with people and just shutting up and letting people talk (laughs) but it is an acquired skill And the hardest thing was to just stop my mind because as human beings, when the other person's talking, we're going, oh, how can I answer that? And off we go on a little tangent. And then, and I do this, I am nowhere close to perfect. I go, oh, and I have an idea and I want to talk about it right now. It's so difficult not to do that, isn't it? 
it is difficult because we want to have connection. So sometimes doing that means, oh yeah, I know that feeling or I've experienced that. Or one thing that I know is wanting to advise someone else, which let's get real, people generally don't want advice or if they do, they'll ask for it. But how easy it is that to want to advise or instruct and it's not always welcome. <laughs> or fix. <laughs> Exactly. Because and it comes from a good space. We want to make the person feel better. And I know it's definitely a male thing. And I'm this I'm backed up by psychologists here, but men just want to make things better. They see a problem, they want to fix it. But women need to talk and be heard. There's a whole different scenario there. That's right. It's and it's sometimes it's amazing men and women together, cats and dogs. How do these things come together? But there's a beauty when there is that able to give and receive and build on each other's strengths and incorporate each other's strengths. That's the ultimate goal, I think. Yeah, I agree. But that listening, because I just wonder how many issues are caused by people not being heard. Ooh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. There may be something in there. Yeah, I know, because quite often all, and I say to my kids, if you hear somebody saying the same thing over and over again, you haven't heard what it is they're trying to say. And they might not be able to communicate it, but you've got to, that's your job. If they're saying the same thing over and over to you, you're missing something. They've not been heard. Interesting. Wow. Because it's interesting because I do this when I'm doing the podcast and I'm talking to you. My job is to clear a space emotionally and in my mind for you to talk into and you feed into the, it gives you the space to say whatever comes up, be whoever you feel like being without any judgment or anything from me. That's important. But if we all did that, because we're human we're in dialogue it's healthy to share information and and yeah ultimately to give each other the space i would see it that i thank you for having this opportunity to be able to share what i want but i also i want to hear your experience i want to know because that then that strengthens the connection between us and our audience it's something about giving and receiving that, that I value. We, we help each other. But we're back to what we were talking about, making the world a more mature and respectful place that, 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 that feels like an integral part of it, being able to give and receive in equal measure. It does, doesn't it? Because this we were talking before we came online about, I asked you whether there is, societies have different levels of maturity because I look at some behaviors in certainly in western societies i just go <laughs> it's like a toddler having a tantrum <laughs> there is nothing mature about what you're doing right now <laughs> so talk to me about that because we did have a great conversation about that and i would love to discuss that a bit more okay let's see yes just as an individual goes through different stages of life and part of what you're doing with your podcast of looking at the different stages of a woman's experience. And what I'm doing with my book, The Well of Truth, is showing a woman develop through her life and developing maturity that she receives from each experience she has. In the same way, our cultures are doing that, hopefully, as well. And we, being American and living in New Zealand, they're both relatively young cultures, is the Australian culture. And it's interesting to see how these, how countries, or you could even say businesses, the different entities go through a process of becoming, of maturing. And this is all part of that. But when it's more difficult if we don't see it happening on the outside in a very clear way. It can be harder to embody that. What does I often look, look one step down the road, like where I'm going to next, as far as my 
personal growth. And I, I think, who can I look, who is an older woman who is living these things that I value? Do you find you do that? I do. Yeah. I'm, I think I mentioned this last time. I'm a real Trekkie. I love Star Trek. <laughs> and I'm just watching Star Trek Picard with an older Captain Jean-Luc Picard. He's in his late 70s, early 80s now. And just his maturity. And he went through a period of feeling weak, as we all do. And now he's come out of it and people, he and the people around him are acknowledging his experience and his wisdom. And I think that's so important because what I see a lot isn't an isn't maturity and I don't see it as a kind of behavior that I want to emulate and I'm it concerns me because it's on a societal level Keely my daughter when she was oh what she was in I think she was 15 or 16 did an exchange for three months to Colombia with this girl in Colombia and she came back and she said it is so dull in Australia compared to Colombia she said everybody in Colombia has got a lot of life very entrepreneurial it's very exciting and there's a lot of energy she said you come to Australia and it's just chill (laughs) there is nothing happening and I can see that but at the same time like you say there's not a maturity about our culture as a whole we're young countries if you're interested there's there's a man named Michael Mead, who's an American storyteller, who a psychologist among many things. And he tells stories that are really about the maturing of man, of humanity. And he, he has different podcasts and things, but it's really, he gives a really interesting spin on how these old tales have informed this process that we're in. And there's also someone by the name of Steve Stephen Jenkinson, he's a Canadian man who's written a lot about death and grief and end of life subjects. And he talks a lot about the difference between being an older and an elder. That being older is just someone who's got older, but hasn't taken on the mantle of being a wise person, a village elder who is able to hold the younger people to be able to be a role model and a real pillar of the society. And I thought that was a very interesting distinction that he made. It isn't it? Because when you put that into the context of what we were just talking about, the maturity of a society, our society doesn't value elders, doesn't value olders, but that's what you get left with is an older rather than an elder. That's right. Yeah. And Looks like that's going to be on us to say, okay, you gave us the challenge. We're going to continue this. If we want to see it, we have to be. How would you be it? How, what would you do? One thing that feels important is having multi-generational connection and having children like we both do and, and being connected with their circles that I know it helps me grow because I'm learning more about what it is for my kids to be growing up and their concerns and their world. But it seems to me that more than trying to fix or advise younger people, for instance, it's to listen to them, to listen to what their concerns and fears are, the things that they're trying to cope with because the list is long. And I, I also know that there's many young people who are upset with our generation and above because we had the good times. We weren't thinking in long term about what was coming down the track and they have to deal with it. And there's not much I can do about that, but I can be present to them. I can hold them and understand them and listen. That's a really great point because I'm sitting here criticizing society for being a teenager throwing a tantrum slamming the doors and everything whereas in actual fact our generation when it was younger we were like the two-year-old who goes over to the Christmas tree and one by one breaks all the baubles till there's none left and then has a tantrum about that so I cannot point the finger (laughs) to get off my high horse (laughs) 
And that's the mystery of life is like, I was once that. And from this vantage point that we're at now, to see that and to be able to recognize ourselves in that, and also to hold a lantern out and say, there's something called maturity. And that's what we're stepping into next. And we may not always get it right, but we have this vision of being connected, building community, being stepping into the wisdom years. That's what this is for us now. And But it's on each of us to find the way forward. Yeah, it, it's interesting because if you look at our society, if we were the toddler smashing everything and breaking everything till it had all gone, which is that I find so frustrating about people now, but because it's our generation's not necessarily learning. I'm not talking about the younger generation here because half of them have got a solid head on their shoulders and there's a few of them who, like everybody matures at different rates, but our generation, some people are still just going around smashing all those baubles. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, I think of it sometimes at, we went to school and then when we got out of school and went on to careers or adult life, People felt like, I don't have to learn anymore. I've learned everything I need to know. And I think it's on each of us to continue our our studies of ourselves and with what's happening in society, these massive changes. And if we want to be part of the change, we better educate ourselves constantly. And if the, it seems to me that people that don't want to do that, they don't want to keep doing their homework, well, then they're holding us back. Don't you think? Look, I totally agree. It's one of the bugbears of any kind of personal development. It's you have a big breakthrough and then 10 years later, you're having a meltdown about something. You go, hang on, I got rid of you 10 years ago. What are you doing coming back again? Because it never goes away. We, You can't, there's no end point in this. There's just constant learning and it is constant learning and constant growth. And the worst thing is, you're never going to get there. <laughs> exactly. And there's an endless array of things to learn about. And I think that's what keeps us human. That's that's what keeps us, at least for me, keeps me going, gets me to wake up the next day, to embrace life, is knowing that, I know less and less as time goes on, but that there there are so many different ways to engage in this huge mystery. And as long as I have that willingness to do that, then I'm going to have that oomph to get up and to play the game, to be part of this thing. And the day that I don't want to learn anymore, I shut myself down. That's not going to be a really good day. That's really interesting. This is one of the topics that I was talking to AJ, the lawyer, about the other week, because people want to feel safe. And the more I learn the less I know is how it feels to me like the more I learn the more I realize that there's so much I don't know yeah and in a way that's an exciting thing because it kind of is like you and I look on it as exciting but a lot of people want things to be safe and predictable and when you realize you don't know something you're not safe true true and and not to say that there aren't days where I wake up and I'm like I don't, I really don't know anything. And it's, it feels destabilizing. And I, and it's, like, oh my God, what's going on? I think we all feel that because every day we're learning, we're having to challenge our assumptions about the ways we were educated or the world we grew up in. But the truth of the matter is that there's only one thing that's constant. The moment you're born, there's only one way you're headed. And Everything is about change. Life is about change. There's a couple chapters in the book, The Well of Truth, where the character is just having to confront that again, like either I'm going to put a barricade up and keep myself out of the world or else I'm going to embrace it and get a surfboard and learn to ride the waves and I'll get much, I'll enjoy or I'll experience life in a fuller way if I recognize that. And that's really the gauntlet for all of us is how can we stay flexible and fluid in the face of the onslaught of change that is our lives? Yeah. And there's two places I want to go with this, because one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was 
that's why we can't offer advice to younger people because we don't understand what they're going through because their circumstances are completely different and and the pressures they've got in their lives we have never experienced so all we can do is offer I suppose guidelines for how to respond who to be so it's more about on an emotional spiritual level than it is on an action level because we don't know what they're doing (laughs) yeah exactly and as a mom that I had these years to help them develop the tools that were in their toolbox for life but at a certain point they're carrying their toolbox and if I didn't put something in I can't be like oh we don't here's the monkey wrench I can't, but I can at any stage be there to support them as they learn their tools or we can learn new tools together or what have you. But I think you're absolutely right that we don't know it's they're, what they're holding. And it's arrogant to think that I can tell them what they need to do or how to handle something. And if you look at it from that regard, then the biggest gift we can give to somebody is that it's okay to be uncertain doesn't give me no certainty so how do you deal with it how do you deal with and that's where we're talking about role models and archetypes that's when that comes in isn't it it is and also community that as a little individual blowing in the wind it's very destabilizing but if you feel somehow that you're held even by one person who can see you and be a home for you wow that makes all the difference I think yeah and being heard as well so those few things all tie together is that they've got to be heard your issue has to be heard and then we can talk about being yes from which actions come out of that That's right. And alongside of that, one thing that I have, that I feel strongly about is that we, everyone needs to be heard without being fixed or changed, but also acknowledge the feelings that come up. And it seems to me that grief is something that's just girding around in the shadows. And sometimes you just got to say, okay, come sit with me at the table and have a cup of tea. And I just need to be present with you. And then what happens, whatever emotion it is, you have your cup of tea and at a certain point they leave. They may spend a couple of days or they may spend, you don't know how long they'll stay. But I think it's important that we also are present with and listen to whatever is showing up. Don't you think? Totally. Because we're okay being with happy emotions. We're even okay dealing with anger and upset. We are not okay in dealing with grief. <laughs> when somebody's grieving, we tend to say, oh, do you want a moment? And we'll give them, we'll leave them alone. What on earth? That's when they most need somebody just standing there, not saying anything, but just giving them the space to process and grieve. And once again, it comes back to that, what we started with talking about the importance of listening, being present with holding a container, whether you call it community or what have you, that we do this for each other. And that's the greatest thing we can do. Holding the space for somebody's grief, though, is quite difficult because we've got, we're going to experience at some level that emotion. We've got to get that emotion. How do we, how do you deal with that? Could you rephrase that question So if I'm just thinking, a friend of mine, her husband died just recently and her son died about 10 years ago as well. And it just think because I'm quite empathetic when I'm with her grief, I just don't even want to go towards how she feels. So I because I feel it on a physical level and an emotional level. Not obvious, obviously not to the extent that she is. I'm not saying that, but it's painful to be with her pain and not be able to do anything about it oh actually I hadn't thought of that maybe that's the thing maybe grief is difficult because we can't fix it I think yeah I think that's one of the things when we see someone else's pain and we want to take it away from them because we love them yeah and we absolutely can't that is hard 
So the difficult thing in that situation is just being able to be with that pain because we don't want to. We don't want pain. <laughs> we just want it to go away. And that's that's one of the characteristics of our adolescent culture is that <laughs> we yeah, push it away. And if we, as we were talking about early, if, earlier, as we move into these elder positions, that's one of the skills that we behooves us to cultivate is that ability to just sit with it, not fix it. Yeah. Just to feel heart to heart connection without having to make it better. I always struggled with what to say. Like when my friend's son died, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept taking food around because I didn't know what to do to make it any better. I didn't know what to say. What am I supposed to say? How are you? I know how she is. She feels terrible. And like now, 10, 12 years on, and her husband's just died, still don't know what to say. And I'm going to fix it. I'm a fixer. I can't help myself. Got to fix it. Got to make it better. But all I just keep sending her emails, just thinking of you. Hope you're going okay. If there's anything I can do, or if you want to talk to me, that's because I just don't know what to say. <laughs> you're following your instincts and food. Things like that, when you're grieving, sometimes it can be really hard to feed yourself the very basics that, and just knowing that there's someone there who's on call, that you need something, I can get it for you. That's immensely comforting to know that someone is has you in their consciousness. You're going through a hard time. Because it is so easy to just, and I think quite possibly... Our culture tends to do this. Somebody's grieving. And this is a generalization. And I'm just, I'm picturing this as I'm going on. We give them a couple of weeks. They're going to be sad for a couple of weeks. And then we expect them to be better. Yeah, it's not linear or logical like that. And often some people, in my experience, they'll manage to make it through the shock phase and seem like they're coping pretty well, but three years down the road, it lands in them and they're really sucker punched by the loss. And so grief is so mysterious. It it just has its own landscape. It has its own language. It's such a, it's such a different thing. And if you're not in the middle of it, you can you can help support, but that's you're an outsider of that world, and it is hard to know what to say or to do. And grief isn't. I remember oh, a long time ago, I read this book called The Grief Recovery Handbook, and it was really great because it said we think of grief as when somebody dies. But in actual fact, we grieve over all sorts of situations. We might grieve because we thought somebody was a certain person and they're not. And there's disappointment there, but there's also grief because we're giving up an idea of what could have been. There's grief in divorce. There's grief in death. There's all these grief. There might even be grieving because you're moving out of a house that you've loved and you've lived in it 40 years. Exactly. And there's... It's so deeply woven into our experience. It's a matter of, do we acknowledge it? And are we able to recognize it? And that's where rituals, just little daily ceremonies or rituals that we can have in our lives to help us physically and emotionally move through our feelings, grief, like this scenario has ended or this relationship or this time in my life and acknowledging it symbolically is very helpful. And I I think a lot about this experience that we've been on and continue to be on collectively with this pandemic. And I have this fantasy of what if every town, city had some ritual acknowledgement of not only the people that have died, but the people whose have, lives have changed forever because of it, for many different reasons, for just all of the changes that came with it. And imagine, what if we had these built these labyrinths that people could walk through and just acknowledge all of the sadness that we have from the changes that, that we've all been through and then all the things that have been revealed along the way 
that we're holding. I feel like that's an important thing. I hadn't thought of that because it's like the cenotaphs, isn't it? The, the fallen soldiers. It's the same kind of thing. Somewhere to go to recognize and acknowledge because we've also got to acknowledge the fact that we did survive and we are okay. And things might not be the same, but there's different opportunities that we didn't expect to have. Yeah. So in in a way, since we're talking about maturing, that it this pandemic for whatever to be said, it is a rite of passage for our civilization. It really is. And whether we step through it, meeting the challenge and can have a deeper maturity, that's yet to be seen. But if we can attend to all of those things that go along with developing maturity, like being kind, forming community, feeling our personal and collective grief if as we put all those things together then there's a better chance that we'll come out more mature but if we're just railing against the machine and smashing the ornaments on the christmas tree and driving crazier and flipping people off that may not be that may not be such a good thing (laughs) Not necessarily constructive behaviour. In terms of societies or us individually, as an archetype, what would you bring into this kind of situation? (laughs) It seems to me like it's really the archetype of the wise woman who's being asked to step in here, who's saying, hey, let's bring it all back home. Let's take care of each other. Let's take care of this earth. Let's not get lost in all the distractions. Come sit by the fire with me and I'm and we're gonna we're gonna dream in this new way that's inclusive, that's loving, that's nurturing, that's supportive of all life. That's what I'm gonna that's what I'm putting my ticket on. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good because it's it encompasses all of those things we were talking about, being heard and being okay with what is. And I think that's the issue that where that fear, feeling of fear and not being safe comes from, we're not okay with what is. We want it to look a certain way. It doesn't look that way. And we're desperate to try and make it look that way again so we don't feel safe as opposed to going, okay, this is what it looks like. Now what? Yeah. So it's all those little threads that we've been talking about are coming together to say, yeah, we don't know, but we're going to, we're going to reach in and bring out the best of what we have to try to meet the situation. And often that looks like, it doesn't look like doing. Mm. It looks like being. I'm feeling as well. Like for me, my, my archetype is not nearly as, hasn't got quite the eloquence that yours has because my archetype just went, dude, chill. It'll be fine. <laughs> the surfer archetype. We need that too. And once again, the surfer I love surfers. I think they're magical because they're constantly watching and reading the changes and they're flowing with it and delighting in the waves that really are synonymous with the waves of energies in our lives and the experience. I think that's a great archetype, dude. Cowabunga. I can't. I'm not very good at that. But it's all, dudes also get dumped. They expect to get dumped. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they wipe out. Yeah. And that's part of, that's part of the package. It's not always shooting the tube and this and that. Sometimes you get dumped. Sometimes you're out there with dolphins. Sometimes the sun is setting. Sometimes the water's glassy. Sometimes you've got these massive waves. You're facing it all and you're and you're orienting yourself around what is in the moment. Yeah, as opposed to going, oh, my God, no, we need to organize these waves so they're more orderly. <laughs> Which is what we try and do. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> so maybe surfing is the path of maturity. Yeah. I've completely lost now because I got present with what you were saying. I was like, yeah, I was out on a wave. <laughs> just, and then I went, oh, my shoulder's sore. I've got, I've got 
rotator cuff problems. I dislocated my shoulder and I've got massive rotator cuff problems. So I'm like, yeah, couldn't paddle the surfboard out. So that was where I went with that then. (laughs) I was out on my surfboard, but wondering if I could persuade somebody to tow me out so I could just go and stand up and do that bit. (laughs) Metaphorical. You can just hold it that way too. (laughs) In terms of feeling safe, Because where I was talking or where I was going with this before was we get very frightened as human beings. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. We get very frightened by things that are outside of our current experience. So say we live in a all white Midwestern town and then somebody from India moves in it's very racist, but anyway, we don't like for me, I'd be uncertain because I don't understand. I don't know what I can and cannot say. I don't want to make a fool of myself because it's all about me, of course. And I don't, but I also at the same time don't want to cause them any pain. So we want things to be very certain in order to make sure that we deal well with our worlds, because ultimately it's all about us, isn't it? We don't want to make fools of ourselves. We want to be right. Yeah, I think once again, this example that you gave is about growth through our lives, that if we're afraid of something or something's unfamiliar, we can other, put it in the other category and not connect. But if you learn more about other people's experiences, culture, which is the beauty of traveling to to other places is that you begin to see the connections like we are all human we may look different or come from different places but we are more connected than disconnected and i feel that being in particularly like a dominant culture that it's imperative to keep growing to keep learning to keep finding out more about other people's experiences that didn't have the same growing up that I did. or so, so once again, it comes back to that maturing has to do with keeping learning, educating ourselves, finding, expanding that sense of how we are similar to other people. And one of the, there's a story in the Well of Truth that's where this woman goes to a teepee for the first time, has an a, experience in a woman's group. And she's looking around at all of these women and she's realizing that even though they're all strangers to her and they have different life experiences, that they they have so much in common. And it's a revelation to her that we're more alike than we are different. And let's find those places and strengthen those places. A sign of maturity is when you realize that it's not about you. What you're saying is when that your character in the book went into the TP, all of these other women having all the different experiences didn't negate anything she'd experienced. It didn't mean anything about her. And maturity is when you're okay being with everybody else, being who they are. Exactly. And in fact, it deepens you and and because you're more expanded and more able to have have them in your heart, in your sphere, in some way. And I think that's like those mycelial threads underneath the forest that are doing the connecting. So Yeah. I thought jigsaw puzzle. I saw pieces uh-huh. of jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Did we talk about what you wanted to talk about? Have we covered that? Oh, I've just been having a great old time. Yes, yes. <gasps> it's been great talking to you because normally I'm the host and you talk, but you want a conversation, which is fabulous because the two of us are just, I've got to tell you this and I will be deleting this. I had one guest on and I wanted her to go into, she was talking about something and I wanted her to go in a particular direction. So I shared a story. She was so offended, she wouldn't answer my questions after that. Ended up not being able to use the podcast. So it's great. So I was a little bit nervous when you were asking me for my opinion, but then I just went, get off it. I just need to have a conversation now. So, yeah. Good. I didn't know that, but everybody has their different style or or what they want the outcome to be. 
as far as how they run their podcast, but I, it feels like your expertise, your experience is just as valid as mine. There's nobody that is an expert here. It's like we're two human beings have had lots of life experience and we like to have a good time. And <laughs> You're as curious as me. That's what I really got. You're as curious about other people as I am. And mm. that was uh, what gave me the impetus, uh, permission to join the conversation. And really, so it was like a co-hosting chat rather than a guest thing. And I think being curious, not we talked about listening and being and holding, but being curious, that's how you keep growing. Yes. <laughs> you can't help it. You want to know more. <laughs> Yeah, but it, that's what makes life interesting. And when you're curious, actually, I hadn't thought about this before, but when you're curious, there's no fear there. You forget about needing to feel safe. It takes you, it like naturally takes you out of your little zone into this place where you're merging with the larger world and marveling at it, which is pretty good. <laughs> I like to live there. Like, I can only ever see the world and the universe from where I'm sitting and my experiences. I can't see it from yours. And that intrigues me because I want to go shuffle around into your world and see the world through your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you do this podcast, because that's a way of engaging and sharing that with other people, this enthusiasm that you have that is infectious. You get other people like, yeah, oh, yeah, I want to learn about that, too. So that's a huge gift that you're offering to the community. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, to me, it's the difference between my life now and what it was when I started the podcast. And I've always been curious about other people. My husband always jokes. He said, do you have tell me your life story tattooed across your forehead or anything? He said, because some random will come up to you and all of a sudden their entire life history. <laughs> That is definitely another one of your superpowers is that you make people feel comfortable enough and that, and you're open and receptive so that they feel that they can share that. It's really a beautiful thing. I've always loved it. I have to say it's not something I've ever railed against. But I, I, And I'm astonished that it doesn't happen to other people. I just, cause it just always happened to me. It's a good thing we... The world needs that. <laughs> it's been an absolute joy again. We've had the best time. Fabulous. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.